the time. So I can't wait to dig into the brain of Lindsay Martin Bilbury. She is here today with us. And we have known Lindsay, like I said, for more than almost probably 15 years. Yeah, maybe Back longer. at our OSU <laughs> days, we had, um, where am I going? <laughs> Lindsay's husband. <laughs> I guess we'll edit that. <sighs> it's longer Do than that. Do we go there? I don't, I don't care. Whatever you want. I don't know. I don't, want, I don't want you to be Levi's wife, you know? No, you're your yeah, own person. Yeah, you're your own person, so we'll We've cut that out. We've known you for years. <laughs> We've known you for years, and you're a powerhouse. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, we'll cut that out. So Lindsay is a lover of... <laughs> Lindsay's a lover of ice sculptures and pie, two of our favorite things, and she aims to make marketing, <laughs> events, and technology easier to enjoy, but she brings 20 years of experience, and really, as long as I've known Lindsay, she has been like an industry expert at events. Um, she was doing this across the country. She has served some of the biggest organizations out there in the for-profit and nonprofit sector, but more recently, she has launched her own company. Uh, called Nifty Methods and Marketing and Events, and they have worked with also incredible um, organizations that trust them to produce events. So she is a powerhouse and a brain and super fun to chat with. So we're so excited to have Lindsay on today. Hey, Lindsay, thanks for coming on. Thanks. I'm glad to be here. Excited. Well, let's jump right into it. What what drew you in? Because, you know, I think there's two sects of people, right? Becky represents one of them, hates <laughs> events, <laughs> doesn't Do wants to never events. go to events if she doesn't have to. And then there's people that just like live for it. You know, it's like, I want to go pick out the chairs and the linens, which COVID has completely um, ransacked that completely. But what drew you into wanting to serve the event space and what kind of, you know, got you here today? You know, it's funny that you kind of position it like that, because on the event side, we often laugh that those of us who uh, run or become event planners, we didn't do it on purpose. Like, I actually went to school to become an attorney, and I got all the way through my degree in political science. I've got a minor in business, and though I grew up doing this, my mom is actually a music director. And so when you, uh, I literally grew up behind hey. a soundboard. And so I, I was helping her run festivals and local church and different activities where she was like, oh, well, you can do this. You're tall enough or like set design, figure it out. So I was calling shows, helping people get on and off and kind of imagining what that could look like uh, as long as I can remember. And so when I got to school, I was like, you know, I'm going to do something like it's, it's a real job. I am not going to live this bohemian life on the road, I, and I, I supported myself through college, running, <laughs> catering, and doing events, and I was like, no, I'm going to do this, and then I got out of school, and I started talking to all the law schools, and was doing this, they're like, yeah, your first four years, you're really going to do a lot of document management, and just sit inside and look at contracts, and I was like, that's ridiculous, so I didn't, <laughs> and I decided, Bye, Felicia. <laughs> yeah, I, I took a, a, a very low paying job um, doing events there in Stillwater, actually, and, and helping run like a dental company. And then my partner, Levi, he moved us to Washington, D.C., and I started working for a gubernatorial race at the time for just complete peanuts and found out I was pregnant. And you cannot work 120 <laughs> hours a week without health care while knocked up. Note to self, ladies. Um, <laughs> and, on peanuts either. I mean, you oh, know? you can yeah. no, and there are more okay. than there are more than a few who do. I mean, that's that's the beauty of the DC internships. But so I, I used my connections and I landed at this amazing education association nonprofit called ASCD. So it's Association for Supervision and Curriculum Development. Basically, they teach the teachers, they teach the superintendents, and because of a series of events, kind of like Lemony Snicket, within three months of me being there, my boss, who had basically run the major annual conference, which was 150,000 people on like a good day, um, retired. Oh <laughs> and so it was me and a coordinator who, oddly enough, now 10 years later is working for me again. Um, I, I took this over with this amazing team and basically just got the best training you could have in nonprofit and association events. And I never looked back. And we kept moving and moving and moving for Levi's job. And I kept just building this amazing network. And so I've been blessed to work with nonprofits, government you know, big corporations, small corporations, startup, and it just, it doesn't matter because events are events. And I like them because I can sit behind a screen and watch these incredible human connections and experiences 
uh, one of the boards I sit on with a global nonprofit group for, that's centered around the events industry, we talk a lot about how, you know, events are where the moments that matter happen. And whether it's the Broadway show that you're coming together and you're watching Hamilton for the 15th time and you're seeing something different, it's causing something to happen inside of you, you, right? (laughs) Or it's, you know, this major, the inauguration, this major political event that's coming in, that's this peaceful transfer of power that's going to happen and just basically change the balance of a country. I mean, it's very small, very large, very frivolous, not frivolous. That's all events. And that to me is powerful and exciting and it's never the same and uh but it always brings the same great feeling so i'm just a, i'm an events junkie but i'm like you uh becky i don't necessarily like to attend them my staff jokes that i'm a professional happy hour in pre-pandemic times because that's that's typically how we all win new business i just go to parties and buy people drinks um, but i wouldn't necessarily go to a large conference where i didn't know a lot of people because i kind of a hermit crab I think that you've made an incredible point just about the power of storytelling and the power of production and events, because I I think maybe I I should clarify why I I don't like going to events that are so transactional, that are completely expected, that are the same event over and over, because I, I, I really have to give John credit and his team, because when we were working at our former um, business. I mean, we, when you're in higher ed, at least for us, I mean, we just didn't need events to fundraise. I mean, you just, you have all these, what I call, I'm using my air quotes, grateful patients and your alumni who have such an incredible time largely in college. And it's such a positive experience. You don't need an event to engage them. They're already engaged. And so for everybody else, (laughs) which, you know, is the majority of nonprofit, you really have to leverage your event in a way that tells your story in a unique way. And I think that just putting on, you know, uh, something on stage and having the same old people say the same old thing doesn't do anything to inspire. And it doesn't make people want to come back in and say, hey, what are they doing this year? What's different? What's new? How are they innovating this space? And so I love that you kind of talk about the, I mean, I really think there is something to, to production and events and threading that storytelling piece so it's not a transactional event so we have an opportunity to go in and actually move someone's heart it can just be an entry point and so I think a lot of our audience is probably talking about you know what are we going to do now I mean we're seeing so many of these little nonprofits whose a a large portion of their revenue budget was contingent on having in-person events and and now it appears you know we're going to be in this for a while and so what would you yeah. kind of say to our audience about what is the new normal for event fundraising moving forward? You know, it's interesting because I think in many ways, all events from nonprofits up to large enterprise has struggled with the same word for a while. And that's engagement. People don't want to give money if they don't feel engaged. People don't want to buy software if they don't feel engaged. People don't want to become a member if they don't feel engaged. And so we talk a lot with our clients and with our team about how are we really transforming attendees into participants? Because it's not enough to really just come and make them feel something. It's important that it's powerful there, but a good event really is a 365 experience. It's that getting everybody excited and pumping them up, just like you do with the music before the podcast, right? There's the reason why you have walk-on music. There's a reason why you've got people talking to you and going out on and on beforehand. There's the actual experience where you have them all together in one space, whether that's virtual, hybrid, or somewhere in between nowadays. And then there's the afterwards. What are you doing with them until you see them again? And so I think that's a piece Beach. that <laughs> as we as we continue that. to move into what is now year two of this really exciting, delightful pandemic adventure, you know, I think it's it's a piece of taking a hard look at your fundraising and going, why are we fundraising for this? You know, that buyer's persona conversation. If you don't know who your donors are, if you don't know why these people are showing up, are they an advocate for the cause? Are they someone who had a personal experience with the mission that your nonprofit is supposed to be serving? Is it somewhere in between? They came along and they were just really impacted and inspired by it. I think there are so many ways that a person can become a participant in a nonprofit experience. And if we look at it from the lens of we're not just creating an event or a fundraiser, we're creating an experience that comes across this 365 
overall place we're doing, it almost turns into a large major gifts campaign, but you're really finding a place from an individual small donor all the way up to someone who's going to give a million dollars plus. And that's the piece for us that just looking at it from the big picture is change the vocabulary in the way that you're talking about it with your board, with your team, with your partners, with your vendors, and challenge them to say, what could that look like? And I think that from there, the iterations of why and why not really do start to bake themselves into the actual tactics of, okay, we need to do a fundraising walk. Well, we can't get everybody together because that's not a good thing. So how do we do this? There's a nonprofit that I work with um, in or England called IMEX, and they run this massive trade show every year. We've helped run their live stream for the last couple of years, and they did a 5K in Las Vegas, and they did one in Frankfurt. And so instead, they turned the hashtag for that that's called IMEX Still Walking and IMEX Together. Because this usual one is I'm, I'm Exhausted, because if it looks together, the play on words, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, and everybody who goes to IMEX knows, I mean, because it's just, the, it's just the culture of that event. I'm Exhausted is a great thing. It means you had so much, oh, so much in that three days, you were able to do it. Yep. And this last May, they have this planet IMEX, they took it and they turned it to a completely beautiful virtual world. And as they did that, they still had those grounded in-person activities like the 5k walk they sent out t-shirts from sponsors and they did all of it so that they really were thoughtful about what is that experience with the delivery drops these custom boxes these ways we're putting on social the email the actual messaging happening on stage when we do the event and then they were encouraging people who didn't even participate to just basically have other places they could continue to donate and that was great because you still got to go and run or you know in my case walk very slowly along the way with the 5k <laughs> you had the leaderboards you had the same experience of that kind of fundraiser but you still had the feelings of what it's like when you got to see each other especially at that point it was may you know everybody was like maybe we'll see the light but the depression hadn't really sent in by the time they replicated it and did it again at the end of september of last year it was something that everyone was holding on to. And it was like one of those one pieces where you were like, oh God, we have to have this. And you can do those throwbacks as we're getting back to going in person, but threading through elements of it. And so don't lose who you are as a nonprofit, but really go, but what's the experience we're trying to be now? Like this is your opportunity to blow the event up. Do it. I mean, what's the worst that could happen? 2020 already did. It, it's not a negative thing to go into the digital space. And I think, I, I'm sorry, John, I know you have a question here, but I just want to make sure we don't miss this because I think you said something really important about you don't want to lose the feeling. And to me, no. that is what we're trying to create. Like it, <laughs> Can't stop the feeling. Cannot stop the feeling. <laughs> but that is the power of a great and transformational event. If you can create a storyline. And I mean, I see it very much, and maybe it's because both of us have mothers that are musicians, but I see it very much like a conductor and, and there are peaks and there are valleys and the music swells. And you want to tell a story on that event that ebbs and flows. And then it, I mean, it, there is an apex to it. And at that apex, the height of the emotion where you are so sucked in that's the point we want to make our ask for them to come into our world. And I think it's encouraging to me to hear you say that there are still very poignant ways that we can replicate the feeling even though we are virtual. Yeah. And I, okay, we're just going to piggyback on everything you're saying, Lindsay. You said something too of that the time is over of just looking at events as like, it's just this event. Like you've, this is an opportunity to say it is a moment in time. You've got this emotion. How do we capitalize on that? If you don't have a follow-up plan, you don't have your event plan completed. Yeah. And so many people just are so glad it's over that they're going to take two weeks off and not think about it when that's the time to like not stop. Like this, you want to harness that emotion and keep going. And I love that you are in that space because COVID may have taught a lot of people that to be more strategic with their events, but I know you've been preaching this for a long time and we're drinking that Kool-Aid. I mean, we talk a lot about it again with like, this is something I speak on a lot because I'm like, there are event strategists and there are event planners. I, you know, I, there's a woman I used to work with the National Speakers Association and she was one of the best damn, sorry, sorry, John, uh, the best darn, <laughs> <laughs> the 
best <laughs> um, best darn event plan. I mean, like from the revenue, I mean, just like the, the tactical details of running and planning and executing event. And you absolutely still have to have those people on your team. And we hear a lot of like saber rattling right now that, you know, companies and nonprofits are laying off event people who do that. I'm like, you still need those people because they're the ones who will form the relationship at these virtual technology companies or with your production teams, where if suddenly you get locked out of this virtual convention center, and it's a heck of a lot scarier than when you get locked out of the actual convention center, they're going to sit there and they go back immediately into crisis communication. Well, you have to have both that tactical and that visionary, and it's not often the same person. There's a few people who can do it, but... There are some people who just love the spreadsheet and the joy of planning the events. You still know those people on your team. You just need to equip them with enough team members who can look further out. And this is a place where nonprofits, a lot of times the staffing structure can play against everyone because you have communication developers and you have dev teams, but you don't have marketing people. And if you don't have marketing people, you're really missing an opportunity because Nonprofit is just a tax status. You still have to do lead acquisition. You just call it donor development. But before they become donors, they become something else. And maybe they're never going to be a donor. But if Oprah never gave you a dime but brought you on for her favorite things, I'd say she was pretty important to your overall you know, health of organization, wouldn't you? So where does that person fit inside your personas? And you need someone whose job it is to look at that. And so I think that's the other critical element of this is, What's your staffing structure or your contractor slash staffing structure look like so that you can try all these different things out and take risks. And when your board looks at you and goes, oh, I don't know if we have the money, go, well, okay, but maybe we don't have an organization either because we're going to have to do something. We're, we're really, we're past a cliff. We're like flying, building the plane in the air with like duct tape and bailing wire. <laughs> we're from Oklahoma uh, I can say that lifting just the conversation that it's not just about the money raised that night I mean yeah. it's a continuum that's one one of the pieces you're going to analyze but there's so many more things that you can take away from an event and engagement and experience so I love I just love what you're preaching Lindsay mm -hmm. so are there some examples of just innovative approaches that you've seen lifted out through COVID that you'd want to share with us I know Everybody's trying to figure it out, but who do you feel like is, is doing it really well? Um, well, we worked with a student nonprofit this summer, and we actually did an eight-week series. And their job, every year, they bring together, basically it's like camps. They bring 120 high schoolers together, and they teach leadership camp for a week. We did eight of these in a row. And you want to talk about keeping your participation you know, engaged and excited as well as bringing in fundraising dollars to fund this adventure. Usually when you're bringing them to places like D.C. and Paris to talk about the actual like leadership, it was an interesting dynamic where they found a way to balance the needs of the participants and the needs of the funders who were very different people inside the space. And so they built these custom box experiences. They literally came in a FedEx box, but it was like, eat the big frog first. So it was like a little baby frog. It was a fun t-shirt where it was like one for the fundraiser that the parent at the school or the person who was leading <clears throat> the large adventure. And then it was all for the students so that when they walked together, they could be seen as a group or a whole, but you had to ask questions because of the way the wording had it on there. They had a really intricate guidebook that helped them kind of walk through the experience and then talk about it afterwards. And that was really interesting because they did it over and over and over again. By week eight, not only did we know everything inside and out, but we also knew what could grow and shift. I think with some of our galas and our fundraisers, our annual events, you know, our one-time walks, we do ourselves a disservice because we only do it once. You know, why, why do you have to do it once? Now you're not necessarily bound by the costs of pulling everybody together into one place and doing that. So I think that that's something that's really interesting. Another nonprofit that we saw that we worked with over the summer, what I really, really enjoyed was the opportunity for them to basically choose their own adventure because they were in different states. So you had some in California, you had some in New York, you had some in the Deep South, you had some in Chicago. So you had these large urban areas and then large rural areas. And it's very different in the approach to how the lockdowns and the different ways you could go into restaurants and take advantage of it. And so they offer different ways to participate in the fundraiser. Instead of just doing a walk or just doing, they had, I think they had a walk, they had a run, they had like a triathlon. 
and then they had a silent auction. They made the silent auction more like a scavenger hunt, so they got local businesses involved, so you could come in and they would help match, so that it was helping restaurants, it was helping business owners on Main Street, and that was really fun because instead of delivering a box, they were saying, here are different ways that you can get participating in your community and still do good. And that was good. I mean, it was a lot of organization, but no less than bringing together, you know, 3,000 people for one large run. And then the last one is one of my favorite clients, the Crayon Initiative. They actually, so what Brian, their the founder, crayon? the yeah, crayons, yeah, no. So he. Oh, I love the Crayon Initiative. I want you to tell what their mission <laughs> yeah, is before you, because yeah, I, I love the story. They, they are just like the most unique group because they're saving the world and helping children in hospitals. And like that to me is fascinating. Their founder was sitting in basically a Chili's. He was like, I wonder what they do with these crayons after they're not used anymore. You know, they could just go to a recycling landfill. And he's one of my favorite Northern California hippies. And so Brian was like, that's crazy. So he took his packaging <laughs> experience and brought it together. And basically, they take old crayons. You can send them in from home, from your scouting adventure, from restaurants, from all sorts of different things. Send them to his facility there in Northern California. He melts them down in a special, very, very, very sanitized way of recreating these crayons. And then he sends them to children's hospitals around the United States. That's powerful on its own, but a major portion of their revenue was sorting crayons at events and employee interactions. They'd go to call centers, they'd go to annual conferences, and just as a relaxation, you take crayons in a big bag and you put them into a bin. It's kind of like the version of adult crayon coloring book. So they did a sort at home activity, which if you're locked at home with your children and you're like, go pick all the crayons up, and now... There's a game where we're gonna put them in a bin. And so he made custom packaging, but you could do that. Like, so it was like taking the things that he already did and then brought it into at home. And they did it over several weeks and then everybody sent back. They ran a campaign on social. It was all user generated content. Basically it cost him shipping. And then the corporation that they were running these sort of at home activities matched the donations. And like, that's really great because they're recouping that revenue value from a donation and fundraising perspective but they're also, you know, generating content that will keep this going without having to spend any marketing dollars. And I was like, that's just, a, I don't know, there was just a lot of fun where it was very thoughtful in the activities, though still full of the, the benefits one could have for the nonprofit. And so each one of those brought their own special culture of who they were as an organization. And I think that's the challenge many organizations now is like, what makes you you? Why do people give you money? Why do people become members of your 501c3? What makes you special? Do that. I mean, yeah. it's a continuum. That's one one of the pieces you're going to analyze, but there's so many more things that you can take away from an event and engagement and experience. So I love I just love what you're preaching, Lindsay. Mm -hmm. So are there some examples of just innovative approaches that you've seen lifted out through COVID that you'd want to share with us? I know Everybody's trying to figure it out, but who do you feel like is, is doing it really well? Um, well, we worked with a student nonprofit this summer, and we actually did an eight-week series. And their job, every year, they bring together, basically it's like camps. They bring 120 high schoolers together, and they teach leadership camp for a week. We did eight of these in a row. And you want to talk about keeping your participation you know, engaged and excited as well as bringing in fundraising dollars to fund this adventure. Usually when you're bringing them to places like DC and Paris to talk about the actual like leadership, it was an interesting dynamic where they found a way to balance the needs of the participants and the needs of the funders who were very different people inside the space. And so they built these custom box experiences. They literally came in a FedEx box, but it was like, eat the big frog first. So it was like a little baby frog. It was a fun t-shirt where it was like one for the fundraiser, the, the parent at the school or the person who was leading <clears throat> the large adventure. And then it was all for the students so that when they walked together, they could be seen as a group or a whole, but you had to ask questions because of the way the wording had it on there. They had a really intricate guidebook that helped them kind of walk through the experience and then talk about it afterwards. And that was really interesting because they did it over and over and over again. By week eight, not only did we know everything inside and out, but we also knew what could grow and shift. I think with some of our galas and our fundraisers, our annual events, you know, our one-time walks, we do ourselves a disservice because we only do it once. You know, why, why do you have to do it once? 
now you're not necessarily bound by the costs of pulling everybody together into one place and doing that. So I think that that's something that's really interesting. Another nonprofit that we saw that we worked with over the summer, what I really, really enjoyed was the opportunity for them to basically choose their own adventure because they were in different states. So you had some in California, you had some in New York, you had some in the Deep South, you had some in Chicago. So you had these large urban areas and then large rural areas. And it's very different in the approach to how the lockdowns and the different ways you could go into restaurants and take advantage of it. And so they offered different ways to participate in the fundraiser. Instead of just doing a walk or just doing, they had, I think they had a walk, they had a run, they had like a triathlon, and then they had a silent auction. They made the silent auction more like a scavenger hunt, so they got local businesses involved so you could come in and they would help match so that it was helping restaurants, it was helping business owners on Main Street. And that was really fun because instead of delivering a box, they were saying, here are different ways that you can get participating in your community and still do good. And that was good. I mean, it was a lot of organization, but no less than bringing together, you know, 3,000 people for one large run. And then the last one is one of my favorite clients, the Crayon Initiative. They actually, so what Brian, you their founder, crayon? the yeah, crayons, yeah, no. So he. Oh, I love the Crayon Initiative. I want you to tell what their mission <laughs> yeah, is before that. you, because yeah, I, I love the story. They, they are just like the most unique group because they're saving the world and helping children in hospitals. And like that to me is fascinating. Their founder was sitting in basically a Chili's. He was like, I wonder what they do with these crayons after they're not used anymore. You know, they could just go to a recycling landfill. And he's one of my favorite Northern California hippies. And so Brian was like, that's crazy. So he took his packaging <laughs> experience and brought it together. And basically, they take old crayons. You can send them in from home, from your scouting adventure, from restaurants, from all sorts of different things. Send them to his facility there in Northern California. He melts them down in a special very, very, very sanitized way of recreating these crayons, and then he sends them to children's hospitals around the United States. That's powerful on its own, but a major portion of their revenue was sorting crayons at events and employee interactions. They'd go to call centers, they'd go to annual conferences, and just as a relaxation, you take crayons in a big bag and you put them into a bin. It's kind of like the version of adult crayon coloring book. So they did a sort at home activity, which if you're locked at home with your children and you're like, go pick all the crayons up. And now there's a game where we're going to put them in a bin. And so he made custom packaging, but you could do that. Like, so it was like taking the things that he already did and then brought it into at home. And they did it over several weeks. And then everybody sent back, they ran a campaign on social. It was all user generated content. Basically it cost him shipping. And then the corporation that they were running these sort of home activities matched the donations. And like, that's, really great because they're recouping that revenue value from a donation and fundraising perspective but they're also you know generating content that will keep this going without having to spend any marketing dollars and i'm like that's just a lot i don't know there was just a lot of fun where it was very thoughtful in the activities though still full of the the benefits one could have for the nonprofit. And so each one of those brought their own special culture of who they were as an organization. And I think that's the challenge many organizations now is like, what makes you you? Why do people give you money? Why do people become members of your 501c3? What makes you special? Do that. I have a question about budget because I think there's a lot of people out there that say, when you talk about production, immediately my executive director, my CFO, my board, whoever it is, is going to freak out because <laughs> events are very expensive ventures. And that's probably why one, I have such an issue with them because as, as a major gift officer, I would rather just go out and ask two people for what I think an entire event could, could put together. Though I do think the engagement factor brings so much to help Which connection. Um, so, and because I have 10,000 gala dresses in the back of my closet <laughs> that I will never wear again. Maybe I will wear one on the podcast one day. So, you do, you should. Yeah, yeah, we should have a dress up day. But I think a lot of people are going to feel trepidatious about moving into a produced event, especially when you're moving it virtually, because you're going to have to have some help with something like that. Talk about how people can work with budget and how they can get the most bang from their buck, because we really do like to think about 
the tiny nonprofit and how we can support them? No, it's actually, this is a question we got a lot last year. Um, and we, we came up with a virtual event budget template. And so I can share that with you. And so I don't know the best way to get it out to everyone, but Ooh, um, yeah, we'll take that. Yeah, we'll if you go to niftymethod.com slash resources, we'll stick it on there. So we'll put that out there, but we have a virtual event budget and it essentially lines out. And I think this is an interesting conversation to your earliest point, John, of, well, we're going into year two of this, but in 2021, we're throwing around this word hybrid, which virtual was scary enough, but now they want us to do part in-person, part virtual. Tell me what that means, right? Isn't that gonna cost enough money? Uh, so the virtual event budget can be split, so you can do hybrid. And all hybrid is, is you have something in person and you have something there. The actual typical largest cost of an event is the venue and the audio yeah. visual. And the great thing about this is it's really democratized some of the access to it. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't book the Four Seasons of the Marriott because I miss them desperately. But there are lots of very cost-effective ways that as you're looking at hybrid solutions, like go to the local WeWork, have the space donated. So that's one thing. But from a production standpoint, just buying the mic, going and investing in some quality basic equipment from an audio perspective and a like microphone or camera that sits on your uh, your gosh computer like that right there you could have it. Uh, we use StreamYard, which is StreamYard.com. That's basically a very inexpensive. It's free. You can put their branding on it, and they can essentially run your virtual event. You use Zoom and you use StreamYard. And like for $49, if you want to put your logo on it, you can run a virtual event up to, I think it's like 6,000 people. Restream is $99. And I think there's a nonprofit discount. Um, the production piece of it isn't as scary. Where I would recommend nonprofits or people who aren't as familiar with it, essentially what you're doing is you're trying to find someone who's run the, what we call back a house in the business. So the people who sit behind the screens when you go to the galas and basically your producers, your person who's running the camera, the person who's helping the people get on and off stage, go find an executive producer. It's a lot of the work that we do. We go and we say, okay, you need this tech for this thing. And you need it to kind of be built in this kind of technical house. Outside of that, you can do it. But we've seen very large events be produced for less than $3,000. A decent camera, a microphone, you know, and, and access to the internet is a lot of times what you need. Now, there are ways to make it better production. We're seeing a lot of nonprofits to enterprise do a lot of pre-taped video. But that takes away some of the live energy you have from a live show. So depending on what you're trying to accomplish with the event, that's a place I would start. Because it's like, what are you trading off? But I think, you know, you could start as small as 500 bucks to get going. Really zero if you had that equipment laying around your house or you've got a decent microphone. PC users, this is not you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just, just an FYI. Um, and then, you know, go up to it in increments because you kind of see the break points of it goes to about $500 and then you jump up to about $2,500. And then if you want to start adding in bells, whistles, video editing, you know, custom sites and things like that, then you're going to start to get up. But I mean, a Vimeo subscription, you can run live events with a Vimeo subscription. You can run live events with a YouTube subscription. Nobody needs anything with a YouTube live. You just press live and you go. You run the risk of them owning your event long term, but that's kind of a conversation. If you're really budget strapped, go and just say, what are free ways to live stream? Vimeo has an excellent article out. We'll put on the resources page where you can go and it literally gives you 55 different options of ways to live stream an event in lots of different events. Because at the end of the day, a fundraiser is the same as a sales meeting. You're bringing people together, you're having them do an activity. So you need to start thinking about the tactical things. Do I want them to talk to one another? Do I want to be able to moderate the chat? Do I only want them to be able where Lindsay talks to Becky and John can't see my conversation? Do I want to share pictures? Do I want to have a wall? So, you know, a lot of the, the confines of what you see in a traditional like virtual event platform is like a website with the tech built in. The thrifty nonprofit fundraising group can kind of go, well, we need these 12 things, talk to one executive producer who can probably line them up with a more streamlined budget and give you a you know, high, medium, low place so they can kind of choose the places where they really wanna put their big dollars and not 
have to go outside of the realm and watch their costs explode. Does that help kind of answer from a really tactical perspective? Yeah, and I would jump in to say, you know, Becky and I ran a gala for a decade here in the Metro. And at the beginning, we had to learn what we were doing. We had no idea. We had on headsets. We're queuing cards. We're queuing sound. Like all the things, which is hilarious to look back on. I am getting on. stressed out even oh, just yeah. it was thinking about it. It was like, absolutely horrifying. But I'll tell you what happened is like, it. you know, we figured it out and we started to get a little bit like, okay, I got this. And we kind of held on to it for a few years. And then we were met with this idea of we could have a back of house team like you describe and it was game changer like oh that. I cannot understate that investment because what it did is it put me as a fundraiser, not at the back table stressing. It put me out mingling and like talking and networking and doing all the things that you can do at an fundraising. event fundraising. So like, I can't yeah. understate the ability of bringing in a professional to do the things that need to be done professionally. Cause you don't want to mess up the sound in the video. That's, that's all you got when you're working vid- yeah. virtual. So yes, I love if, that point. If you are someone, I mean, I am a writer. Yeah. <laughs> I, a, I, I was a fundraiser. I, I have no business right? having my butt in that seat, like trying to moderate so many different screens. And we had the Oscar We're music like that would swell. And, I don't even oh know what that my means, God, you know, John like, doesn't even know what baseball is. So I know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, I just want to give a shout out to if you have the budget, please save yourself the heartache (laughs) so you can go do what you do best, which is engage, connect, because I think about those times. And when we were running the event, I was not Not cultivating. I was not cultivating. I was not engaging. And again, that is why we are, we, they are there is to engage. And so the other thing is, I'm so glad you talked just about the tech because I, I want to encourage everyone listening to, if, if you are looking at your event budget right now, take the money that you are going to spend on that chocolate fountain or the <laughs> ice sculpture and invest it now in your tech. Can't we keep the ice sculpture? Just okay, Julie loves, <laughs> or <laughs> Lindsay likes ice sculptures <laughs> and <laughs> pie. Okay, we'll keep the ice sculpture and the pie. Okay, the, the chocolate smaller. fountain is, is going. So take that money and that savings, invest it in a streaming service, in a great microphone, maybe in the production team, because, I mean, I even saw this with my own church as they were going virtual now. They, they said, we have got to do a huge investment in trying to, to meet people virtually right now. And if you're not, then then the disconnection is just so rampant. So I think that's fantastic. I think that um, that's, that's a place too, when you think about hiring people to help you, the industry, the events industry is basically on fire still. Like 90% of my industry was either laid off or without anything last year. Many of us who were doing virtual before 2020 are the lucky ones just because we knew how to call shows. We had relationships with these people and we were like, okay, we're not going to be perfect at it, but we've at least got a, an idea. That friend of mine who does the incredible event planning with the ordering of the chicken, she was out of work until November. Um, and like, I'm sorry, I, did you say the order of the chicken? Oh yeah, she was. Well, that's a, it's an industry joke. Like good event planners order all the chicken because who can afford the beef cuts, right? Like you want to, you know. <laughs> So terrible. Oh, I'm using that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think that's something like right now, if you go, so I, we have certifications just like everybody else, right? So look for your CMPs. Go to LinkedIn and search for CMP. Go and search for CTES. These are certifications in the audiovisual production world and in the certified meeting planner that basically say these people are experts at what they do and they're consulting. Many of their consulting rates are like from $100 to an hour to $200 an hour. So literally four hours of our time is less than a grand. And so you can basically run the ideas, but you don't have to hire us, though you should. But like, you know, you can go in and that helps you set that pieces, but you might also be able to get some, some deals because these people need to work. They, they are absolutely willing to work with anything, whereas before, and so that means you're going to be maybe working with an event planner who used to run a major, massive, huge corporate event, and overnight that revenue streams disappeared, and now they're looking for opportunities. So for nonprofits who are looking for that expertise at kind of more negotiable prices, this is really a market where you're going to have the upper hand. Now, don't underprice them and say, okay, well, I'll give you 50 bucks an hour because, like, that's 
would you want to be charged that, but make sure they can pay their taxes and keep their houses. But it is a place where you've got some <laughs> yes. opportunities to go out and really leverage the power of the internet, not Google, but LinkedIn and say, who in my network is an out of work event prof? Go and find it. Like they're, they're everywhere. It's a massive, massive industry with lots of people who do lots of things and have lots of skill sets that can probably take your event and turn it up to 11. Ooh, there's my, okay. sorry, that was my Gen Xer turn reference. Turn it up to 11. Turn it, uh, <laughs> that's Spinal Tap. Again, we're, uh, we're dating ourselves again. We are, sorry, it's a good um, one. I, I just look at your roster of nonprofits that you've worked with, which is so vast and extensive, and I wonder if there's a story or a moment in philanthropy that you have witnessed that has just really touched you and, and stuck with you over these years. Um, what's a story that sticks out to you that you might share with our community? This was such a tough question when I saw it come in because I think every, oh God, every nonprofit we've worked with has been so special. In, and I say that with no irony attached at all. Like they just, they're staffed and volunteer driven by people who just believe in so much of it. I think though, one of the greatest examples is, is one close to my own heart in my own industry. Uh, this last year in 2020, every year in April, we have what's called Global Meetings Industry Day. And Global Meetings Industry Day is a lobbying day. It comes together and we work as an industry to go out and talk about why meetings mean business, right? The nonprofit and the associations all come together and we gather as event people and we just talk about the way that these moments that we bring together help matter. Why, why it's good for human connection, but also what it means to be people together gathered as a community and, and showing ourselves in, a, in the, the purest and best ways that events can often do. Well, when the industry and when the pandemic hit, these large gatherings had to stop. And so a, a girlfriend of mine from Canada, she was very upset and she was like, and she just tweeted, she was like, what if we just went out and went virtual? And so this movement of global meetings, Industry Day goes virtual, turned into, well, let's go and try and get a Guinness Book World Record and raise money for the Search Foundation, uh, which helps out of work nonprofits or out of work event planners. And so we did. We didn't actually get the uh, Guinness Book World Record, but we gathered nearly 15,000 people from around the world. We had every continent except Antarctica and they came together for 30 minutes and we just talked about, it was basically a warm hug for the industry. We talked about how much we missed each other and we talked about why what we do was the thing that powered us and why we would continue to support ourselves and helping each other was gonna make us stronger rather than fracturing because our industry is very competitive and it was just this one moment in what had been basically an epic six week train of day drinking because the industry was so terrible at that point in time. And you know, April I think was difficult just as a world. And you could just see us all, people you'd been missing going, okay, we're gonna get through this. And that same group, you know, we now have a formal board, we're moving forward. And so that event kind of going into this April, there's I think a level of acceptance that we're still not a necessarily a tremendously better place as an industry, but there's hope. That same kind of, we're gonna make it, it's gonna be fine, the industry's gonna come out stronger, and as a result, the events that we help drive and power are gonna continue to help you know, bring people together and create those human connections. That's not disappeared, and so that to me is a place where I was like, you know, from a philanthropic perspective, that's why you have these types of opportunities. Not everything can be transactional and it's all great because capitalism keeps us alive in many ways, but you have to have the people. Otherwise, why would you have mission? I don't know. Great I question. Love it. What yeah. a great story. Oh. And I love how the industry itself is just coming together as a result of everything that's happened. Yeah. Um, so Lindsay, we ask all of our guests, what's one good thing? And I know as an event, person you've got all the tips and tricks and hacks to help us look have our a game what's something that you'd offer to our audience something we could do today i think one good thing you can do is to never stop asking questions many times events are incredibly high profile which means there's lots of pressure attached to it too which can stop whoever it is that's both challenging what the event can look like so the participant experience is going to be just the best one possible for that year 
um, that can be very scary. And so don't stop asking questions. Why and why not are not dirty words. They are powerful words that can help you go, well, why not this year? And if the answer is really no, not this year, then make sure you've got a parking lot so that you can do it the next time because now these ideas have started and should be able to take root and find some place to help make it because there's no bad idea for it. So I think that's the, the piece that, you know, we always say that the best event planners are those that are flexible, audacious, and curious. And so do good inside of that and always ask questions of why and why not. Oh, that was oh really goodness. powerful so because good. you're right. I mean, an event thrives and it's at its best when so many people pour into it, when we have voices, uh, you know, that are looking at strategy and looking about how do we represent everyone, which is what I love so much about your story of the individuals out in California, you know, meeting people where they are and finding a way to connect with them. You know, as as we have learned, Becky does not want to come into your <laughs> 600 person gala and dress up <laughs> in, in e cordon blue. I just don't want to. Uh, but if it was something innovative, if it was, you know, something that I could do with my family or something that I could do outdoors, like I would be all in for that. So I, I am excited sort of about this new pivot for yeah. events because we were kind of just stuck in a rut and doing yeah. the same old thing and churning the same old event out now and now we are backed into a corner where we've got to be creative we've got to think about everybody we've got to think about wh where to meet them how we're going to talk to them and we have got to look at events as n they are no longer singular things it is a point in time and Lindsay brought this up at the very beginning thinking about the pre-event thinking about how you're engaging at the event and what is the post-event strategy. This is just one step in how we are cultivating and an extremely important step in how people experience your mission at an event could be transformative and how you engage with them the night after, the morning after and beyond. So thank you for bringing all of your expertise to our podcast. I've learned so much. I'm actually really excited about the potential for missions uh, this year. How could people connect with you, connect with Nifty? I mean, we will certainly um, put all of these um, wonderful resources into the show notes, but where can we find you on social and on, on the web? Yeah, so uh, pretty much it's at Nifty Method. So N-I-F-T-Y, like thinking there's a method to the madness. So at niftymethod.com is where you can find us. Uh, or you can follow me. I, I'm on Instagram, but I'm really bad at it. It's my Twitter. My Twitter is kind of like my brain on champagne and coffee. So uh, at Lindsay, at Lindsay, this EMP is where you can find it. So look us up, come follow us, hang out, say, hey, tell us what you've been doing. That's we get some of our best ideas when you go, what does that mean? Why did we do this? We tried this and it was terrible or it was great. And we want to hear all the stories in between. Sharing is caring. So it let's is. all lift each other up. And if you're not amped up after this, I mean, this has been awesome, Lindsay. Thank you so much. Thank you.